Somebody say influence. Y'all sound asleep today. Say influence. influence. All right now. Some of you are going to have to help me preach today. Somebody say influence. influence. How many of you in this room has been influenced by someone in your life? Raise your hand. Very good. For those of you who did not raise your hand, we know that you're just shy because you have been influenced to not raise your hand when people ask you to raise your hand in a service like this. So today, we know that everybody in this room has been influenced on, at some level. Some of you have been influenced by your parents, right? Some of you have been influenced by friends. Some of you have been influenced by teachers. Who, have been, who has been influenced by a teacher? All right, how many of you have been influenced by difficult, bad, painful circumstances in your life? See, we are influenced in many different ways. Influence is something we cannot escape. Influence is something we all have in common. We have been influenced. Now, how many of you in this room have been influencing someone? Why are there not the same number of hands? Because I'm here to give you a truth today before we even get into the Scripture. You are influencing someone somewhere, whether you realize it or not. Influence is a powerful, real thing. Now, sometimes we influence people to get upset, right? I mean, we don't necessarily, I know we're all Christians, and we don't mean to cut people off in traffic. It just happens sometimes, right? Right? We don't mean to, it's just, it's there, you know. Uh, it's hard for me to think that the person who is cheating and running up the side and then getting in is doing that by accident. That's hard for me. I am influenced to be bothered sometimes when I'm sitting in line and I'm being patient. And somebody runs up the emergency lane and gets over so they can get off quicker than me. It just causes me to be influenced in a very un positive way sometimes but we influence people and people influence us so the question comes now who in here would say do as I do follow my example do your life like I do mine who in this room would declare that right now well, hot dog, I'm glad every one of you are here for this message today. Because this message will speak to that very thing. Have you ever heard someone say, do as I say, not as I... Do as I say, not as I do. How many of you love those kind of people? You go, that's the kind of person I'm going to follow. Do as I say, not as I do. Anybody love that kind of a guy? That kind of a woman? Nobody does, right? You want somebody to say something that is backed up by what they do. Because it means they're authentic, they're real, they've got integrity. So why is it? Why is it that we have neglected such an important thing in Scripture as our influence on others and the influence upon us when it comes to being a disciple? Here's a question for you. Nobody shout it out. And please, don't shout out the answer for the person sitting next to you, okay? What is one thing you wish you could change about yourself? I bet every single person in this room has an answer, probably. If polled, 100% of the people in this room could give an answer to the question, what is one thing you'd want to change about yourself? In a few moments, I'm going to ask you to do something. To make a commitment that has to do with that question, that has to do with this idea of influence. Robbie Gallaty says this, and this is hard for me. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't like this statement, but this statement is true. Robbie Gallaty said, people in a church will always celebrate what the pastor celebrates. If the pastor celebrates bodies, bucks, or buildings, the people will perceive that bodies, bucks, and buildings are the most important thing in church. Because what the pastor celebrates, the church will follow. I see some of you shaking your head. Some of you going, ah. But it's a reality. It's a reality I don't like. I don't like that. I want people to think on their own and celebrate the right stuff. Don't, don't, don't follow me. But you know what? 
I'm here to one to apologize to all of you about something. And it has to do with discipleship. Because if that statement is true, that people in a church will always celebrate what the pastor celebrates, I have not been celebrating the mission that Jesus gave us to make disciples. Here's where I have come in this journey. I have come to realize by looking at Scripture that the problem with discipleship is not necessarily in the pew, but in the pulpit. Let me qualify that for a moment. The person who stands in the pulpit, I believe, should be called by God, pursuing passionately a relationship with Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, they should be the example of the definition for discipleship, which is a disciple of Jesus is learning to abide under the authority of Jesus in their thinking, their character, and their conduct. And the pastor should be the one leading the way in that. As uncomfortable as I am in this idea, people look at me differently than they look at you. I live in a glass house, in a fishbowl. I do not have the luxury to react to things like you do and get a pass. I live a life that sometimes is hard. But the reality is there are a number of pastors who stand in the pulpit even this morning who will not celebrate discipleship, who will not discuss being a disciple, who will not think discipleship. They will think butts in the pew, bucks in the plate, and how nice the building is. How did people feel when they walked through the door? I want to go ahead and warn you today, I am not that pastor. Because you may leave and not feel very good about me today. But it's not because of my opinion. It's going to be because of what we find in Scripture that has convicted me as much as it has convicted. See, I have had to deal with this message before I bring it to you. A disciple is someone learning. Someone say learning. To abide under the authority of Christ in their thinking, their character, and their conduct. It begins with your thinking. The problem is, is we got the wrong thinking. We think being a great disciple is just for the pastor, the Sunday school teacher, for the deacons, the elders, whoever is in the church and leadership positions. They are the ones that's going to be great disciples, but for regular old folk, I get a pass. Ladies and gentlemen, the Word of God does not give passes to any disciple to neglect what God has called us to be. God has not said, here is a get out of free, get out of jail free card simply because you don't stand on the pulpit up here on the stage singing or doing something as a leader in a church. We are called by God to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Christ and the pastors in the pulpit, they fail to lead the way because here's a reality that I will testify to. We have not been discipled ourselves. We don't understand the process. We don't understand what it looks like. We have lived a life. I'll, I'll speak from my personal experience, the pastors I have been around, and myself personally. I never had someone who sat down with me and said, let's talk about being a disciple of Jesus. Let's talk about what does it mean to be saved, born again? What does it mean to never lose your salvation? What is baptism? Who is the Holy Spirit? Who is God? I never had someone walk me through the basics of faith, of spiritual disciplines. Let me tell you, one person who has influenced me in spiritual disciplines is Jane Self, the woman I married. I married her, and for the first time in my entire life, someone modeled Having a quiet time every day. Confession to all of you. Called to preach at the age of 14. The only time I would get into the Word mostly would be if somebody asked me to preach somewhere when I was a teenager. And then sometimes I would get my Bible out because I'd finished my math first because I loved math in high school. 
I would race to finish all my quizzes, tests, whatever we were doing, and I'd get my Bible out and I'd start reading it, and I'd sit there and I'd go, I don't understand this stuff. For one, it says these and thous and arts and got words I don't get, but I'm going to read it because I love the Bible. And I didn't truly understand what it meant to have a quiet time until I married a woman who had lived her life having a quiet time, and I realized I am so so unqualified to be her husband. There have been other people in my life who have come along who have been spiritual giants and I've looked at what they knew and almost envied them. And I'm speaking to you as a pastor. I have no idea what it's like being out there, but as a pastor, it has been a struggle to be a disciple because no one ever discipled me. To even understand the process. How does it work? I guess I would basically say this. The experience that I had was a lack of discipleship influence in my life from other people. I grew up in a culture, a church culture, that once you got saved, you just let God sort it out. If somebody declared that they were born again... Just go to Sunday school, let God sort you out. He will help you grow. You'll become a a great Christian. While all the while neglecting when Jesus said, go make disciples. I think that's intentional. I believe that's a real command. It's not a suggestion. It's not the great suggestion. It is the great commandment. Go make disciples. And I stand going, how? How? Because the church has divorced discipleship and evangelism and split the two apart and said, let's go get people saved and let's forget about discipleship. Let God handle that. Let's just get them saved. Let me tell you something. That is as much disobedience as not even sharing your faith. Because Jesus said to make disciples. So I come to you today saying, I'm sorry, as your pastor. As the pastor of the churches that I have led in times past, realizing what I make important becomes important in the church. And I'm here to declare to you and and say to all of you, as you have seen going through this series, it's about discipleship. Right now, I'll tell you this. In the bulletin, if you happen to have one, You'll see some things that you can tell is important to us as a church. Announcements, VBS, things that's going on. Giving is a huge thing for us. We love to give back to our community, serve our our community. we got birthdays that we celebrate. Why do we do that? Because we love people. We love you. You see our offering? That's bucks in the plate. You see our attendance on Sunday? That's butts in the pew. I know my wife does not like me saying that. I just looked over and saw her face. I'm going to be in trouble when I get home. How many people are online right now? Do you see anything about Wednesday night in here? Do you have any idea what we do on Wednesday night? How about about the number of Bible studies and the number of groups that people are in and they're growing to be like Jesus? Is there any celebration of that in this bulletin? There's none, is there? I wonder why. Why? we don't find it very important we don't get excited to see numbers about people in bible study we get excited about the numbers we see on sunday morning man this place is starting to fill up we get excited about that right jesus did not say go and fill up a church jesus did not say go and fill up the chairs jesus said to go make disciples and i still declare to you The problem has not been in the seats, it's been in the pulpit. Now, I'm sure there are some pastors that intentionally disregard discipleship, but I want to submit to you, there are a large multitude of pastors who do not make discipleship important because they don't understand it. And if they don't understand it and they don't make it important, you know what the people who are in that church are going to do with discipleship? They're not going to make it important. So I want to go ahead and tell you that if you come to Chicopee Baptist Church, 
you're going to hear a lot about being a disciple, the definition of a disciple. We're, I'm working on and I'm, I'm researching and I'm going to talk to people and we're going to figure out how to take somebody from the culture and bring them into a very small group of disciples of three people who are making other disciples. We're going to figure out how to get people there so they understand their faith and Scripture and their life. We are not going to be a place that just leaves it up to the randomness of God to fix it. Because Jesus said, go make disciples. And to me, that's intentional. What's that going to look like? I have no idea. But you know what? I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep researching. I have found some resources. We're going to talk about it. But today, what I want us to really talk about is a challenge that challenged my heart that brought me to the point that I just confessed to you. And I believe this challenge is not just for the pulpit, but also for the pew. Because this will take you to a whole other level of thinking and knowledge. See, I want us to turn our attention to where discipleship should be focused. Number one, discipleship should be focused on Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen on that? Number one, discipleship is focused on Jesus. And number two... Discipleship is focused on everybody else and not you. Pastor, what in the world did you just say? That makes no sense to me. Great. I'm glad you're here. Because listen, discipleship, discipleship is about Jesus Christ and about everybody else around you more than it is about you. Our problem is, is we've taken discipleship and made it about us and how we look, and how mature we are before Christ, and how we can get things from God, and how people will look at us as great spiritual people, and that is not what discipleship is about. Discipleship is more about the people around you and Jesus Christ than it is you. But you know the beauty of it? As you focus your eyes appropriately with discipleship, you grow and you become like Christ, and you're changed, and you're transformed, and you focus more on people around you instead of yourself. So here's what I want us to do. We're going to look at several different scriptures today, so you're going to have to, you're going to, have to follow along with me. Hopefully you've got the app open so you can see the scriptures. Maybe you've got a Bible. We're going to do a little Bible drill here in a minute, because we're going to be going from one place to another. I want you Please have something in your hand so you can follow along so you, you can get this. Because this is, to me, this is the great challenge as a disciple. This is actually something people don't want to talk about. You're, somebody in this room is going to probably bristle up. Is that a good word? They're going to bristle up when we just read the scripture. They're going to bristle up at the thought of what I'm bringing to the table today. You're going to be going, yeah, I don't know about all that. Let's get into it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 1. Look at this. This is an easy one. We're going to put it right over the plate for you to get. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Who are we to imitate? Jesus. Do as Jesus would do. A few years ago, there were bracelets. There were bumper stickers. It was everywhere. WWJD, right? Look, there's one right back there. What? There's another one. If you've got WWJD on your keychain, your car, whatever, raise your hand. One, two, three. Okay, let's get it on your heart, all right? That's the most important place to get it. I love that you, you, you ladies have that. Man, y'all are awesome. You need to share it with all, all of us so we can all have one. What would Jesus do should be on our heart? Paul says here he is imitating Jesus. So right now, you're beginning to think, well, <laughs> Pastor, you, you don't know me. I got a lot of problems. I got a lot of shortcomings. I got a lot of things. that It's a struggle, and it's difficult. If that's where you are right now, you're about to really have a hard morning. Number one, we are to do as Jesus would do. The Greek word here for imitate is a Greek word that we get the word mimic from. The Greek word is mimetesi. Mimetes, that's it. Mimetes, I got you. 
The Greek word is mimetes. We get the English word mimic from it. Do you know what mimic is? How many of you know what mimic is? If you were to mimic me right now and I did this, what would you do? You would raise your right hand. What would you put it down for? <laughs> if we were playing Simon Says and I was going to give away $100 and I said, Simon Says to touch your head. Look at the people playing and I bet you're going to keep your head there until I give away 100 bucks, aren't you? All right, Simon says to put your hands down. Simon says to listen very carefully because what God has for us today may change your life. Imitate Christ. We all can agree with that. We can all get behind that pretty much. We all can say, whoo-hoo. I want you to know this word for imitate, this Greek word, mimetes, Mate, forget it. <laughs> I, I can barely speak English, much less Greek. This word is used six times in the New Testament. One time it's used about imitate God. You've probably read that one in Ephesians. We are to imitate God. Here, Paul says, I am imitating Jesus. One time it's used about imitating God. The other five times it has to do with imitating other people. Five other times, the scripture says we are to imitate others. Now, to me, that is quite significant that we find it five times to imitate someone and one time to imitate God. Notice it says, be imitators of me just as I am of God or Christ or Jesus. So the second thing I want us to talk about. Because Paul here, he is talking about surrendering some freedoms. There are some people who find it hard to eat meat that's been sacrificed to idols. And Paul is saying, look, don't ask, just eat it. But if someone comes to you and says, hey, this meat was sacrificed to idols, don't eat it for the sake of other people. Give up that freedom. Look, what does that mean? The focus that Paul is saying, it's not about you. It's about those around you. And so then he comes down to chapter 11, verse 1. We read these words that Paul wrote in regards to all of this. Be imitators of me. Be imitators of me. What kind of audacity, pride, and arrogance would bring someone to say, be, imitator, be an imitator of me? the wrong way to look at it. Paul confesses he is not perfect. He talks about the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, I wind up doing. I'm messed up. I go through struggles. I go through trials. I go through difficulties. But yet, Paul says in chapter 11, verse 1, imitate me as I am imitating Christ. That's the key. Follow me like an open book. To have such an attitude as that, you have to be living differently. Would you agree? To be able to say, imitate me, is not from a point of pride and arrogance, but one of humbleness to to say, if you want to see Jesus, watch my life. Because I'm doing everything I can to pursue after Him. I may fail. I may mess up. I may not get it right all the time. I may have areas to grow in. But you watch my life so that you will know how to be like a disciple of Jesus. I guarantee you, if I was to ask right now, how many of you want to be in that spot? There might be one or two hands go up in this room. So I don't feel like I've got you fully convinced. I want the Holy Spirit to work on you as we look at Scripture, not my opinion. This is not my opinion. We're looking at what the Bible says. If Paul had only said, imitate me one time, we might be able to dismiss it. He just said it to one one church, one place, at one time. So let's really dive into this a little bit more. Take a left. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 15 through 17. For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ... Yet you would not have many fathers, for in Christ Jesus I became your father through the gospel. You know what that means? 
I'm the one who was teaching you. I'm the one who shared the gospel with you about salvation. I am the one who's been, been the example. I've been the one helping you grow. Therefore, I urge you, verse 16, Therefore, I urge you to watch Billy Graham, not me. Therefore, I urge you to just read the Bible. Be like Jesus. Now, understand, I am not saying you need to be like me or anybody else in this room, but here's the thing. If I'm being like Jesus and you're trying to be like me because you need an example to see, you don't fully understand it, then who are you being like if you're being like me if I'm being like Jesus? A equals B equals C, so A equals C. See, this is part of the discipleship process. But here's where our thinking's got messed up. Oh, don't follow me. I'm a mess. What if Paul had said that to these people, to this church, to these believers? What if Paul had said, don't follow me? We would be in agreement with that. We'd say, absolutely, Paul. But yet he says to imitate me. We must take a look at this and the challenge he has brought to us. He says, I urge you. I plead with you. I am begging you. I'm telling you it is of the utmost importance that you do it now. Be imitators of me. For this reason I have sent you Timothy who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. This is a great place for me to talk about family. Some of you are struggling with this idea and concept right now because this is really about influence. This is about influencing people, right? If I say, imitate me, it's about influence. I'm going to influence you and you're going to do as I do. Okay, now, let's think about family. Let me tell you something. On September the 18th, 2001, my thinking changed. That was the day Jayanna was born. As a dad, I set forth in my mind to live a life that she would know what kind of man to marry. She would know what kind of man she would know that God wanted in her life. That even got more serious when we had a second daughter. Oh my goodness. I changed my thinking to make a priority of living before my children the kind of man they should have in their life. Let me tell you something. It's not been easy, and I have failed many times. There have been, been many times that things have happened, or I have reacted, or something's going on that has not been very Jesus-like. I'm just confessing to you as a pastor. I am just a human man. But my thinking changed when I had children. I was willing to change the way I Think, act, talk, live, work, so that my children would be influenced in the right manner, in the right direction, so that they would know what kind of man that they needed in their life. If I can do that for my children, why is it not true that God wants us to do that for all those who are around us? God wants us to live in a mindset that someone can look at us at any moment and see Jesus Christ oozing out of us. And they can look at our circumstances and the way that we live and the way that we talk and the way that we are, we are doing life and go, that's who I want to be like. Can I tell you something? This world is lacking for great mentors and great heroes. All we got is a bunch of rich Okay, come on now. I don't want to get too, too, too opinionated. We got a bunch of rich babies that people are looking up to because they're popular. And they're terrible role models for our children. We need some serious Jesus character, Jesus thinking, Jesus acting people for kids to look up to and say, that's the kind of marriage I want. That's the kind of man I want to be. That's the kind of woman I want to be. I want to be like them do not back away from the responsibility God has given us. This is the great challenge. We have to live our life for people to look and say, I see Jesus. Because not everybody can look at Scripture and get stuff out of Jesus, but everybody can look at you and they should see Jesus. As we 
Look at another scripture, 11, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1. We obviously saw where he said, imitate me. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. Take a right. When you hit Galatians, hit the brakes and slow down because you're about to hit Philippians. Philippians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. Therefore, listen very carefully to this. Therefore, all who are mature, mature what? They got gray hair? Mature in Christ. Those who, th- who are abiding under the authority of Jesus in their thinking, their character, and their conduct. Therefore, all who are mature, let's have this attitude. And if anything, you have a different attitude, God will re- reveal that to you as well. However, let's keep living by that same standard to which we have attained. Brothers and sisters, brothers, fellow believers, join in following my Example, maybe that's a better word for you that you can grab a hold of today. Imitate may be a a commitment you're not ready to make. But how about example? Join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Observe those who walk according to... He is telling people to look at you. He is telling each of us to look at one another and to live our life like we see our brothers and sisters living. Can I tell you something, though? Churches are filled with baby Christians who have been saved for decades. Because, again, I believe the church has failed to disciple people in the primary spot of responsibility, in my opinion, rests in the pulpit and not in the pew. He is saying here in this scripture in Philippians chapter 4, follow my example and follow the example of those around me. Those around Paul, you know who they were acting like? Jesus. How do I know that? Because Paul was acting like Jesus. And if they're acting like Paul, they're acting like Jesus. And they come to a place where their main focus is to act like Jesus. So this is a challenge that he brings to the table that should rock our world. Philippians chapter 4, verse 9. As for the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Practice these things. The things you have seen in me, do what I've done. Here's the problem with Christians today. Don't do as I do, because I like doing what I do, and some of it isn't right. Can I just be real? I've been one of those Christians that would not say, imitate me or follow my example, because there are some things in my life I just did not want to give up. You might be one of those today that you're going, yeah, pastor, yeah, okay, good sermon. When when is lunch? You may be already checked out, but there are going to be some of you today that's going, you know what? I want to embrace what God's calling us to be. Someone that people can imitate. Someone that people can look up to. Someone that when they look at you, they see Jesus, and you don't have the excuses. Well, I'm just a sinner. I mess up all the time. That is okay. Understand, people need to see people mess up. They need to see that there is grace and mercy and forgiveness. And when someone lets lets things fly out of their mouth that they shouldn't even say, that they go, you know what, that was wrong of me. That is not Christ-like. I've been convicted about that, and God is changing me from within. What better way to see people's lives changed than, than for people to see Christians changing to be like Jesus? But yet we make excuses. Well, I'm not the Apostle Paul. I'm not a pastor, and I'm not Jesus. But you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, called to abide under His authority in the way you think, your character, and your conduct. And it is very clear to me that God is declaring to us, we need to live our life so that people can imitate us, and they'll be like Jesus. I'm going to say the same thing that I said in a previous sermon. God just brought it to to my mind. There's some of you today that people do not need to be imitating. Because we already got a mess. We don't need another one. 
But there are some of you today that's in that situation. You need to step up and say, I don't want to stay like this. I want to be somebody that somebody can look at me and be like me, and they'll be like Jesus. God has called us to that position and that place. Number three, not only is Paul talking about do as I do, he also says in 1 Thessalonians, just take a right, two books over, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord. There's that word again we mentioned earlier that, that means mimic. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord. Some people need to imitate you so they can learn to imitate Jesus because they don't understand what it looks like. You have come to imitate us. Notice the pronoun. It's not just about Paul. Paul isn't saying in 1 Thessalonians, imitate me anymore. He's saying, imitated us. You have come to imitate us. If you look at chapter 1, verse 1, you'll see who the us is. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Three people. So this idea of people acting like Jesus and for people to be looking at them so that they'll know how to act like Jesus has spread. It's gone to another generation. It's more than just Paul. It's other people. So he is saying here in verse 6, You also became, you started imitating us and in imitating Jesus, having received the word during great affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. Through affliction, what better way for somebody to see Jesus in your life than when things are hard? But I can tell you, if you wait till they're hard to try to act like Jesus, you won't act like Jesus. You're going to act like a fool. You need to be spending time with Jesus before those hard times hit. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Take a right. It's the next book over. Chapter 3. Verse number 7. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. You ought to follow our example. Because we did not act in an undisciplined way among you. We lived a way that you would know how to be a believer, how to follow Christ, how to struggle, how to fail, and how to get up and keep going. How to give glory to God even in the moments when you didn't even feel like doing anything, but you felt like giving up. He is saying, follow our example, imitate us. And if you're of the persuasion that maybe it's just Paul that says this, look in Hebrews chapter 13. The majority of scholars do not believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Someone else wrote the book of Hebrews, and if that is the case, then this is someone else bringing their voice to the discussion. It's in Hebrews chapter 13, last chapter of the book, verse number 7. Remember those who led you who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their way of life, imitate their faith. Imitate. I want to ask you a question before we get to the know this. Can you say that to people today? Could you declare you imitate me as I'm imitating Christ? And if you do that, you'll be imitating Christ. If your answer is no, hold on, I'm going to ask you to do something in just a few moments that I hope will change your thinking and your way of life. Because I want you to see from Scripture, let's start with how we think that this idea of asking the people or being willing to invite people to imitate you is a biblical concept. So here's the know this. Let's break it down. Let's make it e easy. Know this. Live in such a way that you can invite people to do as you say and do as you do. Now, this is where some of you are probably bristling up going, Oh, I don't want my kids acting like me. I don't want my neighbor to act like me. I don't want... You know what? That means you got work to do. 
And you have a choice in how you're going to respond to this. Are you going to live your life in a way that says, you know what, I'm not perfect, kids, but I'm trying. I'm working to try to get to a place where I'm more like Jesus. That will say more than pretending like everything's okay in your life and you're perfect. Because these kids need to know, these neighbors, these people in your life need to know how to respond as Jesus would respond to stuff in your life. But we use excuses, don't we? We use excuses. I've wrote down a couple of ideas of how we use excuses. Number one, do not imitate me because I am not like Jesus. And for that person, there might be an attitude in their heart of, I've been trying for years and I keep failing. I keep messing up. Don't try to be like me because I'm a goof up. Can I say to you, if, if that's you, we need you. We need the person who is trying to be like Jesus to step up and say, let me share with you my struggles and how Christ is helping me overcome it and grow me and how I am not perfect. Paul even says in one place, in one of the chapters we, we've read, he says, I have not fully attained it yet. I'm not perfect. But yet he says, to do as I do. Because the, ex the example he set was to be a growing, learning disciple who is teaching others by their example. Who's sharing life. This is, this is everyday life discipleship. That's what this is. Living a life so that you can speak into someone's life at any moment. And people are watching you. Listen, here's the truth. It's not in your notes, but I'm going to tell you one. Somebody's watching you. There's someone watching you. It may be that they've been watching for days, months, or it might be just for a few minutes, but someone's watching you to see how you respond to stuff, how you act. And some of those people have been encouraged and challenged. And you'll never know this side of heaven how you have touched their life. I beg of you today, I urge you. I urge you to live a life that people can imitate you and they will be imitating Christ. Do not imitate me because I am not like Jesus. You're not perfect. That's okay. This isn't about being perfect. This is about being willing to live a life that says I'm trying my best to be like Jesus. If you're waiting to be good enough to say, imitate me. When is good enough going to be good enough? When's going to be the line? Can I tell you? I believe it's now. I believe now is the time for people to actually follow after you to say, I want to be like that person. A second category of people may say, do not imitate me because I am not Jesus. This is the one that I hope the Holy Spirit gets a, a hold of your heart and just rips it apart today. The one who says, do not imitate me because I am not like Jesus because you don't want to give up things in your life that you know is wrong. You want to continue to make excuses for the way you live and the way you act and the way you think. You don't want people to be like you because you're not like Jesus because there are things in your life you are not going to change. Just the way you are. Thank God you don't have people imitating you. I hope today you will begin to think differently and say, wait a minute. What am I doing when I say I don't want people to imitate me because I'm not Jesus because there are things in my life I don't want to give up I want to hold on to this sin nobody knows about it I'm, I struggle with this but I'm doing nothing with it please release control be that person who says I don't want you to imitate me because I'm not Jesus but I'm trying my best to be like him 
Be the kind of person that people will look at and know how to respond as Jesus would have us respond in life. Jesus said to love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. There are many things that Jesus said that will challenge us to our core. What do we do with them? Do we have one set of standards when we show up at church and another one when we walk out the door and go to work? That's not character. That's hypocrisy. Today, I hope God has begun to work on your heart and your mind in regards to this idea. And again, listen to me. This is not about perfection. It's about, somebody say influence. This is about influence. We are influencing people. And people have influenced us. This is about influence and allowing what God is doing in our life to pour out into other people. 1 John chapter 1, verse 11 says, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does what is good is of God. The one who does what is evil has not even seen God. They don't know God. They're clueless about God. I'm going to assume today that many of you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And I'm going to urge and plead with you to live a life at this level that you can say without a doubt, imitate me as I'm imitating Christ, as Paul did in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. I want to pause for a moment for you to think about if that's what your mind was set on, what would you change in your life? If you were to wear a t-shirt that said, imitate me, for I am imitating Jesus, what in your life would you have to change so that you could wear that t-shirt without any worries? At home with your family? In public? Ladies and gentlemen, this scripture has convicted me, it has worked within me, it has caused me to see what I do as a pastor completely differently because the level at which I sit is much higher than yours. Not just physically. I don't like it. I'm going to be real with you. I don't like that I have to live in a glass house and people look at me differently than they look at other people. I don't like it. I don't want to believe it. I want to ignore it. I want it to go away. But it doesn't. But as your pastor, I want to lead the way. And I want to be the example. And I'm going to tell you right now, there may be times that I fail. There may be times that I have success. But here's what I want to always do. Pursue Christ in every single moment of it. So that I can say, you imitate me, you'll be imitating Jesus. What must I do with this? What do we need to do? This is lifestyle discipleship at its best. Number one, decide... It begins with your mind abiding under the authority of how Jesus wants us to think. Decide to be a great role model spiritually to others around you. Remember, discipleship is more about the people around you than it is you. When you begin to get your focus off of you and onto others, all of a sudden, if you're living a life for other people to look at, all of a sudden it's going to cause you to live a different life. Start looking at others. Decide to be a great role model spiritually for other people. Second one is this. Work. This is not easy. Work to be a great role model spiritually to others. It's not going to happen overnight. Philippians chapter 1 says that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to the day of completion. One translation says perfection. That is the day we get to heaven. You are a work in progress until you stop breathing. I'm a work in progress until I stop. Paul the apostle was a work in progress until he stopped breathing. What are we to do with all this? Mark Dever said this. The discipling life is an others-oriented life. It labors in the power of God to proclaim Christ and present others mature in Christ. Remember, we've talked about that great goal, which is to see people mature in Christ. 
So how do we take this today? How are you to respond to this idea of what's one thing that I'd like to change about me? Some people may say, my hair, my hair color, that I have more hair, that I have more money, that I wouldn't be so angry, so mean, that I have a better job, a better car. Can I submit to you today, one of the greatest things you can change about yourself is to live a life where people can imitate you and you feel free to say, you follow me because I'm following Christ with every ounce of my being. I may mess up, I may make some mistakes, I'm not perfect, but you follow me and you're going to see how a man should be a follower of Jesus. I would say that is the greatest thing that we could all change about ourselves because it will change the way you think, the way you act, and everything you do. So here's your challenge today. This is your seven-day challenge. Discuss with two people this week about who, who in your life have been a great influence and then what kind of influence do you want to be to other people? How do you want to influence people? Many times we will talk about we want to influence people in ways that we're not living. So let me challenge you as that comes up that you make a decision to live a life so that you can invite people to imitate you because you're imitating Jesus. It is a generational thing. We want each generation to follow after Christ and the only way for them to do that is to see Christ in you because less and less people even care what this book says anymore. Fewer people in our culture could care less about this book I hold in my hand. But I got news for you. If you imitate me, if you follow me, if you follow my example, this is the foundation on which I will base everything in my life, every decision I make as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, as an individual, as a shopper at Walmart, as a driver of a car. This will dictate to me how I live. Not the culture, not the Facebook friends, not the popularity of something I see. There will be no means that's going to dictate how I live. This right here will dictate how I live. So if you follow my example, it should be that you are following the example of Christ that is set forth in this Bible. I declare that to you today. I will not be perfect. I will make mistakes. And I guarantee you that the majority of the people in this room will say, well, absolutely, you're the pastor. You should live that way. Why have you placed on me a standard you're not willing to place on yourself that God has declared for each of us? This morning, if you want to commit to be someone that other people can imitate, follow, and have an example that people will know how to become like Jesus, I'm going to invite you in just a second to raise your hand as a commitment. It's one thing to talk about it, to think about it, to endure this sermon. It's another to do something with it and say, I, am, I want to be a better person so I can say, I can actually invite people, come alongside with me. I'm going to teach you how it is to pursue Jesus. Even in my mess, I'm going to teach you how to pursue Jesus. If that's going to be you, I want you to raise your hand in just a moment. But here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to ask you to do it in front of everybody right now because I don't want anybody to feel pressured. This is between you and God. I want everybody to bow your head and close your eyes right now. Rolling back to that one thing that you would want to change about yourself. Maybe your mind has changed from that original question and I pray that the Holy Spirit has worked in you, that you have realized that, gosh, I need to... God, I need to be more like Jesus so that people will imitate me. Your Word has made it very clear that I should live a life so that people can imitate me, and then when they imitate me, they are imitating Jesus. I want to live at a different standard. I want to live by the biblical standard, the authority of Christ. I want to think. I want my character. I want my conduct to be under His authority more than ever in my life. I have failed. I've not wanted people to follow me, but I want to make a commitment this morning. I want to decide today that I'm willing to put in the work to be a great role model spiritually for people in my life. 
Some of you probably feel like you have failed people in your life spiritually. Today's a new, a new day. Today's a day to make this decision. So I'm going to count to three. Raise your hand. Everybody's head's going to stay bowed. Everybody's eyes are, are going to stay closed. And you're going to raise your hand as if you're reaching out to God to say, God, I need your help to do this. Because you can't do this on your own. But it's going to require you to make this decision to say, God, I want to be the kind of person people can imitate and they'll be imitating Jesus. If that's you today, you want to make this new commitment and this decision, would you raise your hand on the count of three? One, two, three. Raise it up. And declare, I want to live my life so people can follow me and they'll be following Jesus. Father, I thank you for who you are and how you have changed our lives. I thank you for the challenge this scripture brings to us that it has to strip away all the excuses, that it has to strip away all the reasonings we come up with why people shouldn't imitate us, but it makes it very clear. Paul, the people around Paul, the people that those people taught were to be living a life that people could imitate, and when they imitated it, they would be like Jesus. That is a standard by which we've lost in our churches and our culture. May it begin in this room, in this place, that people will commit to live a life at such a level that they are great role models spiritually on how to respond to cancer, to death, to anxiety, to stress, to temptation, to anger, disgust, greed, envy, lust, unforgiveness. Father, this is the kind of thing that will begin a revival. That will change. That will change people's lives. Help us submit to your authority. Help us live in such a way that everything we think is to be like Jesus. All the values we have, all the character that we have, it's like Jesus. That our conduct, as it reveals those things in our life, will be like Jesus. Today, Lord, if there's someone here that doesn't even have a relationship with you, may this be the day that they commit their life to you fully and completely. They ask you to forgive them and take over their life so that they can be a disciple, so that they can begin to grow. And they can watch the rest of us as big of a mess as we are and the mistakes that we make, see how we can respond like Jesus. Father, as a pastor, forgive me for not making this a priority. Forgive me for being passive in this area. To just expect you to just do the work, even though you declared for us, for me, for believers to be making disciples. Father, break my heart. May I weep for the people in my life who needs to be more like Jesus. Father, when I struggle, may you shine brighter. When I don't know how to keep going, may you be my strength. When I have more questions than answers and anxiety is high, may those in my life see someone who wants to respond like Jesus. Lord, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for this great challenge. God, that makes me uncomfortable. I'm just going to be real with you, God. It makes me very uncomfortable to have to live a life where I have to say, be an Im imitator of me. But God, thank you for changing my mind that I no longer speak like that but I get to live a life pursuing you so that others will get to be like you by looking at me. Thank you for those opportunities in which you've challenged me. Help us all grow to be like you in Jesus' name.